Welcome to Lesson 2B, Introduction to Pressure. In this lesson, we'll define pressure. We'll discuss some types of pressure measurement. We'll discuss head, which is an equivalent column height, and we'll do some examples. Here's some basic principles about pressure. It's a scalar. It's defined at a point in a fluid. Just like other scalars, for example, temperature are defined at a point. Pressure is a normal stress. It has dimensions of force per unit area. If this is some object in the flow, pressure acts everywhere normal to that surface. Here are some common units of pressure, atmosphere, pascals, kPa, kilopascals, bar, and psi. First, let's talk about absolute pressure. You always have to use absolute pressure, which we denote by P or P abs, in any equation where P stands alone. In other words, it's not a difference in pressure. For example, the ideal gas law. We must use absolute pressure here, just like we use absolute temperature here. Our notation is P by itself without any subscript is the same as P absolute. When you're analyzing a change in pressure, you can use either absolute or some kind of relative pressure. For example, delta P, which is P2 minus P1. These two pressures can be absolute or relative. It doesn't really matter, as long as the units are consistent. This is similar to delta T. We can use degree C or K when we're taking a temperature difference and it doesn't matter. Now let's define gauge pressure. It's the value of pressure above local atmospheric pressure. Here's the equation for gauge pressure. From this definition, P gauge is P absolute minus P atmosphere. Keep in mind that this is local atmospheric pressure which can change with conditions in the atmosphere. Let's do a quick example problem. Jared measures the air pressure in his car tire with a pressure gauge. The reading is given. The local atmospheric pressure is also known. We want to calculate the absolute pressure inside the tire and give answers in several different units. We use this equation, solve for P abs. By the way, we chose to spell gauge as G-A-G-E, but an actual gauge that you measure with has a U in it. Some people put the U in gauge pressure as well. We plug in our atmospheric pressure and our gauge pressure, we get 340.92 kPa. We can justify four significant digits, so my first answer is 340.9 kPa. To convert to these other units, we use unity conversion factors. We plug in our p-abs using all the digits we have available to avoid round-off error, and then use a unity conversion factor. One atmosphere is 101.325 kPa. I'll keep four significant digits, and we get 3.365 as our answer in atmospheres. We do the same thing with bars. One bar is defined as 100 kPa, so our answer is 3.409 bar. Notice that the units of atmosphere and bar are very close, but they're not exact. Now let's do PSI. You can look up this unity conversion factor. I get 49.45 PSI. Note that some authors would write this as 49.45 PSI A. In the English system, the A means absolute, whereas PSI G has a G, which means gauge. This is one thing kind of nice about the English system. In the metric system, you simply have to say absolute or gauge. Now let's look at vacuum pressure. PVAC is the value of pressure below atmospheric pressure. Here's the equation. If we compare with the above definition for gauge pressure, we see that they're the same except for a negative sign. PVAC is minus P gauge. But PVAC is used only when it's positive. In other words, when the pressure is less than atmospheric pressure. For example, in a vacuum chamber. I say only because it's not proper to use a negative vacuum pressure. In other words, use PVAC only when PVAC is greater than zero, when it's positive. Let's do another example problem. Here we measure the air pressure inside a vacuum chamber. We give the reading and the local atmospheric pressure. We need to calculate the gauge pressure inside the chamber and also the absolute pressure in several units. First, P gauge is negative PVAC, so we have our answer right away for that. For absolute pressure, we use our equation defined above. So P abs is P atmosphere minus P vac. We plug in the numbers. Both of them are in kPa, and we get 1.35 kPa. Using proper subtraction with significant digits, three significant digits is appropriate here. Unit conversions are similar to what we did in the previous example. P abs is 1.35 kPa times a unity conversion factor, giving us 0 0.0133 atmospheres. We do the same for bars, and we get a similar answer, 0 0.0135 bar. Let's multiply by another conversion factor, namely 1,000 millibar per bar. Since this is such a small number, low vacuum pressures like this are often given in terms of millibars. I have a short YouTube video called Principal Principles about pressure. Here's the URL, and I'll show some clips from this right now. What's this talk about pressure in my class? Well, sir, we're all confused about pressure. 
its direction and types of measurements of pressure. Yeah, well, I'll share a short PowerPoint presentation about this. Pressure is a scalar, not a vector, but it acts along the inward normal at every point along the surface of an object. This holds even if the object is imaginary and inside is just the fluid. Pressure increases in the direction of the gravity vector, which is down in this case. If you shrink this object to a point, it confirms that pressure is a scalar acting at that point. Pressure is a normal stress. Its dimensions are force per area, or m over lt squared. Common units of pressure are pascals, which is a newton per meter squared, or in English, PSI. A standard atmosphere is about 101.3 kPa, or about 14.7 psi. But pressure is often expressed as an equivalent column height of a liquid. 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere. This means that the change in pressure from top to bottom of the liquid column is one atmosphere. There are three common types of pressure measurement. Absolute pressure is pressure relative to a total vacuum. We call it P or P abs. This is the same P you're used to using in thermodynamics. Gauge pressure. This is the value of pressure above local atmospheric pressure. The notation is P gauge. P absolute is P atmosphere plus P gauge. This is what you read with a tire gauge, for example. This reading is a gauge pressure. To get the absolute pressure, you take that gauge pressure and add the atmospheric pressure. Vacuum pressure is the value of pressure below atmospheric. The notation is PVAC. The relationship is P equal P atmosphere minus PVAC, which is exactly the negative of P gauge. PVAC is a positive value used only when the pressure is below atmospheric, as for example in a vacuum chamber. Vacuum gauges are often labeled backwards, like this one. A reading of 20 inches of mercury means PVAC is 20, P gauge is negative 20, and the absolute pressure is P atmosphere minus 20 inches of mercury. Here's a diagram to help you understand it better. Suppose atmospheric pressure is 96.5 kPa, and we have a gauge pressure reading of 48.3 kPa. We add the two to get the absolute pressure, 144.8. Here we see atmospheric pressure, gauge pressure, and the sum which is absolute pressure. Since P is greater than P atmosphere, we should not use vacuum pressure. Another example, at the same atmospheric pressure, suppose P vac is 48.3 kPa. The absolute pressure is the difference now, which comes out to 48.2. Again, we have atmospheric pressure. We subtract vacuum pressure, and we get the absolute pressure. In this case, since P is less than P atmosphere, we can use a vacuum pressure. Hey, dude, thanks. That alleviates a lot of pressure, man. I didn't realize that pressure was a stress. That explains why when I'm under a lot of pressure, I get stressed out. I think you are always stressed out, little buddy. Here's some takeaways from the video. Pressure always acts inward normal, and that could be on any object, real or imaginary. In other words, even in the middle of a fluid with some imaginary surface. Pressure always acts inward normal. We also briefly mentioned the equivalent column height of mercury, or head, and that's what we'll discuss next in more detail. I will derive this equation in the next lesson. For now, if we let z be up and gravity vector be down, this is a simple way to express the change of pressure with elevation. P below is P above plus rho g times the absolute value of the change in height. For example, if z is relative to some arbitrary reference frame and g is down, we're looking at a dam holding back water. This symbol, which we'll see a lot, is the symbol for a liquid surface exposed to atmospheric pressure. So the absolute pressure at this point is P atmosphere. Since that's the high point here, we call that above. And let's take a point at the bottom of the lake as below. And if the depth of the water is h, this equation gives us p at the bottom of the lake, p below, is p atmosphere, that's p above, plus rho g times h. This is where the concept of equivalent column height comes in. If we have a tube filled with water up to some level, where the surface is exposed to the local atmospheric pressure, and we're looking at some point here, if we call this distance h, the pressure at this point is p atmosphere plus rho g h, just like it was in this case, which we showed here. The gauge pressure by definition then at this point is just rho g h. We sketch gauge pressure here. This column height h is called the head. Formerly head is the column height of liquid equivalent to the pressure, and it can be used for either gauge pressure or absolute pressure. Here we're using H as a gauge pressure equivalent. This is why sometimes you hear people say the pressure is 15 meters of water. What does that mean? Pressure and height have very different units. What it means is it's an equivalent column height to describe that pressure. This is more easily explained using an example problem. Let's take the first example that we solved above. We solved for absolute pressure. Now let's write it as an equivalent column height of mercury and water at 20 degrees C. 
First I look up the densities of water and mercury at 20 degrees C. I get 998.0 and 13,600 for water and mercury. And these are in units of kilogram per meter cubed and at 20 degrees C. For the water, we'll call H sub H2O the equivalent column height of water. In this case, we're using an absolute pressure, a little bit different from what we did here where we used a gauge pressure. As I said, you can use either. Just make sure your reader knows which one you're using. So in this case, P abs is rho GH. So H sub H2O is P absolute over rho H2O G. We plug in absolute pressure from the first example, density of the water, G. We now plug in two unity conversion factors, a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton, and a thousand newton per meter squared is a kPa. All the units cancel, except this meter in the numerator. Our equivalent column height of water is thus 34.83 meters. We repeat for the mercury, the only thing we change is this density. Everything else is the same and we get 2.556 meters of mercury as the equivalent column height. One final comment, we never said anything about the fluid in this particular flow. It could be water, it could be mercury, it could be air, it could be any kind of fluid. But We can always pick a fluid that we express an equivalent column height or a head. Here we used mercury and water. Sometimes certain alcohol solutions are used as column heights. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.